Welcome to Gator Bites, the official business podcast of the Maryland Davies College of Business. I'm your host, Miguel Gomez, and today we have with us Dr. Michael Pettit. Welcome to the program, Dr. Pettit. Thank you for having me. Right on. Uh, before we start today, uh, we'd like to go ahead and just remind you to follow us on social media at UHDCOB on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and X, the platform formerly known as Twitter. <laughs> uh, things always change in the world of marketing, don't That's they? That's correct, yeah. Well, um, before we begin, I'd like to go ahead and just uh, ask you a little bit about yourself because you have such an amazing career. Um, we had a chance to um, do a little bit of background research on you before, and also I've been a student in your class. <laughs> yeah, it's been a little while now, yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, you have such the depth of experience. Please tell us a little bit about your marketing career in radio, print, digital marketing, and tell us what you do here at the Maryland Davies College of Business. Uh, sure. Um, well, in terms of, um, I've been a full-time uh, lecturer here uh, in the marketing department for, I guess, coming up on about five years. And wow. previous to that, I did some uh, part-time teaching. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so uh, previous to kind of being a full-time uh, professor, uh, I had worked as a practitioner full-time for oh, almost 20 years. That mm. sounds like a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, just to kind of go through the areas, um, I was an advertising major and then um, had made the decision that I wanted to work a bit in the, in the sales area. Like many students, I wasn't quite sure when I was finishing, um, finishing my degree exactly what my path was and I became aware of this kind of like media sales as a, as a thing. And so I spent a chunk of time uh, at, uh, my first job was actually at Clear Channel Radio where I was an account executive for Mix 96.5 and later I, I managed that radio station as a VP, many years later at a different, uh, under different ownership. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, spent a time as a national rep in print uh, at Hearst, the Houston Chronicle, as well as um, kind of went into the digital space there. That was kind of when, cron.com was one of the early um, kind of um, early newspaper properties that invested heavily in digital and we functioned as an in-house agency there so I learned a lot uh, um, and so uh, when I finished business school I was recruited to CBS um, and so I was at uh, CBS radio mostly in the radio division some some television some radio but mostly radio um, mm -hmm. in Houston mostly some in Dallas um, but I was there for uh, about eight years and um, my last chunk there I was a vice president in charge of um, the hundred person sales organization uh, for the Houston market. So I actually there uh, was uh, on the team, a very small team that did the marketing research and station flip from hot 95.7 to 95.7 the spot. Um, so that kind of new radio station, if, if you like it. Um, I picked the, the logo color. <laughs> 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 because it's a small team that kind of works on, we did the research to uncover that. Um, and then uh, about that time is when I started transitioning into teaching more. I ran a female and minority owned advertising agency for three years. Wow. Um, and then, but more recently, uh, just do it only, you know, much more limited, uh, only on a part time basis, uh, doing some consulting under, uh, under Clever Cut Consulting for a couple, really mostly kind of my previous clients. I work a little bit at a nonprofit. Uh, I run a think tank in the area of marketing organization. Um, so the kind of management of marketing groups that the trade organization is called MMA Global in New York. Um, so work with some very famous researchers there. Some of the work is published in the Harvard Business Review. Um, and so that's kind of like, a, like, that's kind of my, that's a quick background on my practitioner work there. So. No, that sounds like you've had like a lot of breadth of experience. And I remember specifically, I was in your class when the transition happened to 90, the new transition happened at 95.7. Mm. I was actually in the car and I heard the switch over when it happened, mm, and okay. the new promos <laughs> and all that. So um, it it's had its staying power. I mean, we're coming up on a few years after that transition and yeah, yeah. I still hear it on the radio on my drives into work this morning. It was actually the uh, most successful station change in the history of the CBS Corporation. Um, and so uh, we did a marketing research project. In fact, it's something that informs when I'm teaching some of the concepts of marketing segmentation. We paid for this expensive marketing research project that was against uh, the demo that we chose was Women 2554. Mm -hmm. And in the project, we found like actually there's this area of um, area of unmet need in the market that was really more it, it, it's an adult need rather than just uh, leaning uh, into that demo. And so we had to make a kind of a very scary decision uh, without the right research because we didn't properly look at the entire market. We were we made assumptions about who our customer was. 
So I remember when we tried to convince uh, the team in New York, because it's really a small, when this happens, it's a small team. It's like two people that are considering a change like that because it has to be a secret. Mm-hmm. Uh, competitors will. And uh, uh, we knew that when we were going to sell the concept into the executive team, you know, literally the CEO in New York, uh, that they were going to be like, well, why didn't you guys do the research against b- more broadly? Mm-hmm. And I'll never forget in the, in the New York accent, I'm not saying who this was, but they said to us like, well, we don't have a better idea, so we'll let you do it. And so we literally, they let us do it. And then it was the most successful change. So we immediately, the ratings were like, we went from like 18th to like second. So it, it exceeded our wildest expectations. It was, it was a cool project, yeah. No, and that's amazing because you, you took a leap of faith. And sometimes with marketing, we're sometimes, uh, in a way, storytellers. And we're also a bit of magician in the dark arts because <laughs> you have to make assumptions based on what do your personas tell you about the audience that you're trying to engage with. Mm-hmm. And you, have to, you can't always know exactly, is this person going to attribute to this uh, new concept and this new model, so that's really exciting. Yeah, yeah we did we did pay for some fancy research, but mm-hmm. the research study, the the crafting of it was imperfect because we only looked at one component of the market. So the format actually is called adult hits. The, mm-hmm. the format it actually typically leans heavily uh, like men thirty five fifty four, mm-hmm. and so we didn't have the data there. We we're like, oh, but it's it looks so good in the demo that we studied. It'll probably work. <laughs> and it did, but that's, yeah, I mean, in real life, when you do a marketing research study, uh, you know, we had some data to inform our choices, but it was a, it was a scary choice. So, well, and it turned out to be right. Listen, I've made many of this, many other mistakes. That was not one of them. <laughs> no, you, you've shared with us some, um, but I think that the thing that a lot of our audience wants to hear is, um, you have a lot of this experience, you know, the starting points and what we see in this new generation of business professionals and more often than not entrepreneurs is everyone has a need for marketing. Mm -hmm. Um, So as first time marketers, what advice would you give to someone who is running their own business and where should they start and why should they consider integrating their campaigns to make sure that their messaging is consistent? Yeah, I I guess one of the kind of, um, I don't know, it was a buzzword a few years ago in the industry was the concept of multi-touch attribution where um, instead of giving credit to just like you know, if someone clicked on a Facebook ad and then they made a made a purchase uh, online, then do you give all the credit to that Facebook ad, or do you give the credit to other things? So, um, framing of the goals ahead of the start of the campaign, you know, it's nothing too fancy. Uh, something related to smart goals that they're specific, measurable, um, achievable, reachable, and timely. But we very frequently, as marketers, skip the step of like, you know what is it that we're trying to get the target consumer to do? What is it that we're trying to get the target consumer to believe? And we jump right to the really fun part. The creative part is what's like fun. And so we jump to that part and skip the uh, kind of uh, the goal setting component and then an understanding of how we will measure that, which attribution metrics, whether it's Google Analytics or in-store traffic even, whatever it is. Um, So that's like my main, um, you know, I even say this in class, um, I myself chose advertising and marketing as an industry because I thought it sounded like a more creative thing. I was like a band nerd <laughs> and president of the debate team. I thought I was going to write jingles in advertising. I never wrote a jingle in my life. <laughs> but I thought it was going to be like, oh, this is a creative way to do business. Um, and so we all have this kind of bias towards doing the fun part. But you get to do more of the fun part if you're really successful. And to be really successful, you have to set the goals up. That's what makes you like... Whatever you're doing, that's what makes you more successful. And either if you're at an ad agency on the client side or at a big uh, media company, um, in all of those places where most of the marketing jobs are, if you uh, do a good job about framing what you're trying to get the consumer to do or trying to get them to believe, um, you're more likely to be successful. And if you're successful, you get to do more of the cool, fun, creative work. So that's, that's the part that we skip a lot. I think that that's the foundation that you build any type of successful marketing campaign on. You have to be able to, unlike your friend in New York, you have to come armed with the facts and the figures <laughs> that support your direction that you want to take. Mm. And creative is always a fun part. I I often think about those images of your Mad Men in the 60s. It's slick. You're mm. creating these awesome campaigns, but uh, there's a lot of work that goes into building those campaigns. And I think that you just led me into my next question with just saying creative. Um, a lot of marketers have access to 
these smart AI powered uh, creative tools such mm -hmm. as CapCut, uh, Canvas. What are some common pitfalls that you see when people use these tools and what are some tips and best practices that you would give them in terms of being able to create a consistent brand image? Because creative is the fun part, but um, there has to be a little bit of, you know, some, some steps to it. Yeah, well, and even, um, especially for copyright, like copy AI and some of these others that um, uh, even chat GPT you could use to help write copy, which mm -hmm. is kind of a creative process. But the um, uh, it's a bit right now, uh, and this is the, the think tank, you know, the nonprofit that I work on, uh, the trade organization, it's one of the things that we're trying to understand the extent to which artificial intelligence affects some of the areas, the organization of marketing, meaning like, who will be do like, is it about um, becoming a prompt engineer? As a copywriter, previously, um, you might have um, just written all the copy yourself. In fact, I've written, something I've done a lot of in my career is written copy. Mm -hmm. um, but now you can u utilize uh, AI to write that copy for you. Um, so what does that mean? Like, will you have one prompt engineer that inputs into AI to get multi uh, versions of copy? Um, but so I think it's a bit of an unknown unknown right now. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we, I would frame it around like, in these technology changes, there's a body of research around how um, changes in technology affect the world that mm -hmm. we could lean into um, in, in, in there. There's also, and that's possible. It's also possible that AI represents kind of what we would call, like it's a, like an exogenous variable, which is just a fancy word to mean like, hey, that doesn't fit in with our current models, it's separate. Um, and so if it is indeed exogenous, then we don't really know how it's going to affect things. Um, so uh, it's okay that, w that that's still forming. Um, but I would say there's an opportunity for students to become, um, you know, there's a lot of jobs in this area of prompt engineering around AI. And there is pretty strong evidence for this uh, concept of using AI for personalization and creative. Mm. So just the fact, like if you get a banner ad and um, it has your name in it. Um, it's one of the things that's kind of being studied. It's like, okay, does that work better? Is it creepy? What is the consumer, how does it change the consumer's perception? Um, you know, even if it's personalized a bit around like, if you're working at a supermarket and you are more like, you are a strawberry person, not a mango person, well, should you get the mango version of the banner ad rather than the strawberry version? And can AI generate that for you? Mm. Um, and so uh, those are some of the tools that I think where it appear they appears right now to be the most promising in the areas where I've worked as a practitioner uh, and done a bit of consulting is that you can see a real tangible um, enhancement to the, the goals, the, the, the conversion goals that are set apart. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's some ways the most exciting, which is not like, by the way, that's still not as fun as the like, ooh, but all the cool creative things that could come out of it. I mean, you're talking about mangoes versus strawberry or whatever. Right. But that versioning there appears to be an, uh, some nice evidence that that personalization uh, could be really helpful. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it's a, it's right now, we don't fully understand the extent to which it will affect the business, but we, we kind of, it, it could be similar to other technology changes, but it also could be largely different. And it's, I think there's a value in reserving judgment right now because we don't, we don't fully understand uh, if it's one, the other, or a combination. I think that's so fascinating that you mentioned the strawberries and the mango. <laughs> I, I can think of a situation where at some point we reach AI-driven A-B testing where we deliver mm -hmm. different types of ads to different customers based on those preferences. Um, so to follow up on that, do you think that we're at an inflection point in marketing when it comes to the rise of AI? And do you think we're facing a paradigm and how the industry is going to operate as a whole and the, is the model going to change? Uh, yeah, so um, some of the things that I'm mentioning, these are actually real. There's um, some of the nonprofit trade organizations have begun engaging in this type of research of AI personalization. It's in its infancy. Um, and so that's one of the things that I've actually done a bit of uh, work on as a practitioner um, is uh, the research around that. But, but so I guess the answer is it already is starting to happen. Mm. But large organizations are just beginning to understand the extent to which. So before, if you wanted to A-B test something, right? Yeah. You made uh, the famous example that's in one of the textbooks we use in class. It's like, you're selling green t-shirts. You put a gentleman in the green t-shirt online, and in one version, he's got a beard, and the other version, he doesn't have a beard. Mm -hmm. And you Photoshop on or off a beard for the guy. Right. And so you figure out, like, which one sells more t-shirts. That's the standard kind of A-B test. 
Um, what AI creates is more of this kind of multiple variables of like, what if you could have a hundred versions of created that were AI generated specific to the individual, all in an integrated system that the human actually doesn't touch. And what you learn is that it's, it, it appears that it may not be as simple as that, oh, we sell more t-shirts if we use the model that's got a beard versus not. Um, what you learn is there's certain segments that respond better to one version and certain segments that respond better to another one, and you can dynamically send the ad to the right person. And so mango to the mango preference, strawberry to the strawberry preference, except it's mango, strawberry, grape, lemon, avocado, whatever, the, all the different versions. So it really, it actually kind of changes the whole um, idea of um, A-B testing is in some ways already at the at the uh, at the bleeding edge of this industry is already a little bit outdated because it's like oh we're not even gonna worry about it's not a b it's a b c d e f g h i j k like it's uh, as many variables as um, you know the AI system can generate so uh, the systems have the potential to unlock um, increases in um, in performance that are not like one or two they're like fifty x and so that's some of that what's beginning to be seen at the practitioner level right now. So it's cool, it has a lot of impact on what we do in the classroom because having some, some understanding of AI and how it impacts marketing um, is important for, um, for students and practitioners to have a little, you know, some education around. So. That is so fascinating. So, you know, we're at the cusp of a lot of changes in marketing mm -hmm. and there's a lot of recent grads or soon to be grads that are marketing majors. What advice would you have for them to, in a sense, prepare for this coming shift in the industry. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, we often dream about working in an agency or mm -hmm. working at a large company in-house or working at a small boutique firm or at a nonprofit. Uh, marketing is very dynamic in that it applies to a lot of fields. Mm -hmm. uh, what tips would you also give to students who want to find a good fit as their first role or their next marketing role? Yeah. Um, okay, so let's start. Uh, well, let's start with the like uh, how AI will kind of change things and what advice I would have around that. Mm -hmm. There are, um, from working a while in industry and then um, also you know being a teacher for a while, there are certain skills that I that appear to me to be uh, more uh, durable. What I would say they're more durable in their application. Mm -hmm. So, as an example, understanding that you need to segment the market by looking at the entire possible market and grouping the entire possible market into possible segments before you then decide which of those segments are worthy of targeting um, uh, is kind of somewhat universal. And whether AI is doing that and, and you are a prompt engineer that's, uh, that's you know, figuring out the precise language to type into an AI system for it to segment the market the way you want it to, or you are a marketing researcher that's using Google Trends to figure it out. Like it could be one or both or a combination of those things. Um, the understanding of the evidence-based approach does not change. Mm -hmm. And so I think um, there's a, a, those kind of durable skills are ones that I try to focus in. You know, listen, in the classroom, we have certain things in, you know, that we have to cover that are important for every student to know. Um, but I will tend to spend extra time on these areas like, okay, well, I know this is a durable, um, I've worked with many marketers and I see if you get some of these concepts, it tends to, uh, it tends to make you more successful. So um, I guess uh, the advice that I would have there is, um, you know, it can be really, really fun to, you know, and we do this in class, getting Google AdWords uh, certified and Google Analytics certified. Um, those are skills that are very helpful. Uh, but also understanding some of the um, deeper conceptual things around segmentation, targeting, positioning, uh, important components of persuasion that are that you know are somewhat fixed. Like we as humans are not necessarily changing the uh, stimuli that we respond to. We are still persuaded by things like scarcity and reciprocity and the concepts of liking from the GLD new research and things like that. Um, so there's certain things that are very durable that we shouldn't get like blow by because we're excited to learn about uh, one of the new shiny tools. And so, um, you know, I think, I think that's, uh, that's a somewhat important. The work that we're doing, you know, 
whether it be in an undergraduate class or a graduate classroom, I can see that much of what I learned in my undergraduate or graduate education, like there's certain things like, oh, that still applies no matter how much change there is. Mm -hmm. And I think that's in some ways the value that, you know, the degrees that we're working on here together that they have is that you are better able to cope with what will continue to be a lot of change because you have um, deep understandings in certain areas that guide your thinking. Um, and so that's really the work that we're doing here is to help you continue to have durable skills that guide your thinking as the, um, as the outside world of marketing continues to change. Um, now for your second question, related to any advice that I would give to a student that's trying to figure out like, okay, what do I wanna be when I grow up? <laughs> um, here's the thing, no one really knows uh, and that's okay. What I would say is it is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and it's very common, listen, I was a graduate too, where you're like, you feel like it's time to sprint as soon as you finish your job. Most students were gonna change their job, right? And, but it, it, that just, uh, that feels like not kind of the, uh, the dream that we all have when we're finishing school. Um, and so uh, understanding that it's a marathon, not a sprint, and understanding that jobs are really, they're about managing trade-offs because mm -hmm. there's no perfect job. So one of the things, um, depending on the class, I will talk about is the jobs that are like really, 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 really cool. And I've worked in some of these jobs. It's like, it's really cool. And, you know, you're at a concert and then you're at the Super Bowl and then you're working with this awesome like CMO of some cool brand and client. Yeah. And that's really cool. The really cool jobs, there's normally some trade-off that comes with that. Yes. So it may pay a little bit less, or it may be really stressful, or it may be really competitive, or all of the above. Um, and there are other jobs where you're like, okay, this like job is really hard. Like, say you're like a, um, or even stressful, like a, a media sales executive, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, it's stressful because I work on commission and that's stressful, uh, but also like I have a lot of flexibility in terms of my schedule, and if I'm successful, I can, you know, uh, be compensated really, really well. You know, media salespeople, it's not uncommon to be well into a six-figure range, not that long into a career, right? Wow. Um, and so, uh, you know, first and second year even, it can be, it can, uh, it's, uh, it's possible, I've seen many people do it. Um, and so, but there's a different trade-off. It's like, okay, well, but if you're not successful, you will not be compensated well. Um, and then there's a lot of in-between. And so I would say that I, I have worked in, uh, uh, on the media side, I've worked as a consultant on the brand side, working directly with brands, and I've also worked as, on the agency side. And there's trade-offs to all of them, and uh, that doesn't mean that none of them are perfect and none of them, they all have pros and cons. And as people, we'll be in different stages where, I've had many friends that are like, they start in one stage where they're like, right now I want, I want money, or I want a cool, I don't even care about money, I want this, I wanna do really cool creative work, and I wanna like, um, you know, I want to see my work on a billboard and see it in Times Square and all of those things. Um, but then that might change. Like you get a little older and you're like, actually, you know what, I'm, I want more creative uh, creativity or I want more money or I want less stress or I don't mind more stress. Um, and so understanding that it's a trade-off, um, I think is healthy framing as, uh, you know, I work with students many times involved with helping them make context to, to get jobs. Um, the um, understanding that it is a trade-off and then having, um, as we are graduating, I'm like kind of having an idea of like what we think, like I think I want, I think I understand like what's most important to me. That makes you, um, from someone that's hired many people, um, it makes you uh, a, a, an attractive candidate if you kind of appear to have an understanding of what you're getting yourself into. So you can be more sure if you're a hiring manager, like, oh, this person kind of gets like, the, you know, the, the, there's no perfect job and this one comes with, you know, it's better in this way and it's worse in this way. More flexibility, less money. More money, less flexibility. Cooler work, more stressful work, all those different things. And so I think that makes uh, students that have uh, reflected on what's important to them and they're able to articulate that to a possible employer, I think that makes you a, a very strong candidate for employment because you appear to understand uh, what's important to you and so it makes it more likely that you can get a good fit so there's always a set of trade-offs and the idea that the grass is always greener on the other side is kind of a it's kind of a 
a fool's errand, but human nature, yeah. Human nature. <laughs> but you know, that being said, while we're dreaming of our next career move, we often think about what can we do today. Mm. And you are involved on campus with the American Marketing Association. Tell us a little bit about that and what are some opportunities for the students if they join AMA? Yeah, um, so I myself was a member of the American Marketing Association when I was an undergraduate student. Uh, I, I was also an officer. Um, some of the connections, not my first job, but the second job mm. I ended up having uh, was connected with someone I met uh, that uh, in the American Marketing Association. So you don't, you just don't know uh, the network that you begin working on, where it will take you, and what will where it will lead you. Um, but uh, I think, um, especially for students that are feeling like I. I want to understand more about the industry of marketing, mm -hmm. and you don't have to know exactly what you want to do, um, but in the AMA, you may get the opportunity to be exposed to these different ideas through guest speakers uh, that, you know, we bring some, last year we, we brought some executives from Disney, the year before we brought some executives from ExxonMobil, um, we also have brought people from, um, uh, we did a company tour at the Houston Chronicle, we bought brought people from uh, the media firm Odyssey that's formerly CBS Radio, some friends of mine that I used to work with. Um, and so you get some exposure. We, we brought uh, people last year from, I believe it was last year, Love Advertising Agency, Kelly Rodriguez, who's a fantastic speaker. Um, so the goal there is to expose people to different parts of the business in a, in a kind of safe place so that then you have more information on like, who, what might I want to do? What sounds good? Which people do I kind of identify with? More like, ooh, that looks like what I want. And so, to me, that's one of the main um, one of the main benefits. You also get the the benefit of here's the thing that's crazy: these people that you're going to school with, that you're like, oh, so and so that I went to school with that used to steal my chicken nuggets. I'm talking about someone that I used to steal my chicken nuggets when we were <laughs> studying. It's like they're going to end up really successful. And I was like, uh, and so not only are you networking with. Um, professionals, um, getting to go to cool, uh, fun events that do good for the community, because we, you know, we also do, um, uh, we're involved with charitable activities, but you're networking with your own crew, and that crew is going to go, you don't know how successful, like, I promise you, people, uh, it's kind of surprising, like, the people I went to school with, I'm like, you mean, they, like, they weren't even that good, and now look at them, they're like this big time, uh, you know, like I said, they literally, I would get a 20-piece chicken nugget studying, and they would eat Twelve of them. I'm like, that's rude. You can only have ten of my chicken nuggets. <laughs> and now, you know, they're like, uh, 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 this is not one of my. But I have a friend that I went to school with that is now uh, in charge of marketing uh, globally for WhatsApp. Um, no. And uh, yes, yeah, and she, uh, her name is Vivian. I went to school with her, and she is uh, a fabulous marketer. Wow. Um, we were in some of these organizations together. And so, like, she and I have stayed friends, but, like, none of us would have known. I was like, do you know Vivian's going to be, like, a huge big You just don't know. And so it's cool being friends. Like, these friends and uh, uh, that you're making in school, not only will you be successful, but so will they. And that's nice that you have that community that's, um, you know, when one of you is thinking of a job change, you guys will keep talking with each other. Uh, in addition to the practitioners that you meet, in addition to the um, beneficial community activities that you'll be involved with. So. I can uh, fully attest to that. I have a friend who I was in school with at the time, mm -hmm. and we were both part of AMA, yep. and when it came time for us to first land our agency jobs, she was in-house somewhere, and she wasn't the happiest, and I opened the door, and I got her foot in the door at my own agency, mm -hmm. so it's one of those things where you create those lifelong friendships and those lifelong bonds by just being involved in school, because you never know who you're going to end up working with in the future, or yep. you know, you never know what doors of opportunity they might be able to open for you. You'll end you up know. helping each other, and I think as students, I've been a student, you're really mostly thinking about which job am I going to get when I finish school, mm -hmm. and then you're like, oh, this helped me, like... It helped me in my life, and that's cool. So I think that's something that can't be under understated. Is like, um, it's an investment in yourself, and it's fun. And I don't know, being a member of the AMA is like twenty nine dollars or something. It's not a huge like. So I think I definitely something that I recommend. I mean, I did it when I was a student. It benefited me, and so I recommend it for anyone that's interested in marketing as well. And twenty nine dollars in this economy to open <laughs> the doors. What else do you want? Yeah, it's a, it's a. I think it's a reasonable <laughs> investment. Yes. 
Okay, good to hear. Um, okay, so I think that this leads into our last question. Okay. Um, you know, you worked in radio for many years, mm. and I often think back to one of the top hits by Fleetwood <laughs> Mac, Go Your Own Way. Okay, yeah. As, as marketers, at some point we reach a point in our careers where we've worked in different roles, and uh, sometimes we might want to make that shift where we go on an, our own direction, and we want to start our own business. Um, I saw that you have a new venture, mm -hmm. Clever Cat Consulting, um, and I remember stories about you telling about one of our cat, one of your cats, Jujubee. Yeah, that's true. Um, so I have two questions. Okay. One, is Jujubee a clever cat? <laughs> and two, uh, what advice would you give to experienced marketers who want to go their own way? Uh, so yes, I have recently confirmed that. So Jujubee showed up at the, at my house one day. She's like four pounds. She's very small. <laughs> Um, I thought she was a kitten. She mm -hmm. tricked me. She was not a kitten, but uh, she uh, uh, she now um, you know is uh, is a great pet. But um, I have two cats. Uh, John Luke is uh, both of them are tuxedo cats. Uh, John Luke is a big tuxedo cat, and uh, Juju B is little. Mm -hmm. uh, but John Luke recently had like a tooth thing, so I had to take him to the vet, and he had to get uh, unfortunately um, some work done on his teeth, and so as a result. Um, I had to put the food away because he wasn't allowed to eat the crunch on the food. Mm -hmm. And so Jujubee was not used to not having her food out all the time. So she learned how to come tell me, meow at me when she was a little hungry, and then uh, lead me to where she knew the food was. And so she would turn around and meow, see if I was following, go a little bit, and lead me to the food. And I was like, oh, you are clever. Because <laughs> uh, you know that you know how this whole food thing works. Before that, I had their food was just in, a, in an automatic feeder and always out. So I'm wow. like, hey, you figured that out in like a day. Because poor John Luke had to have not the same food as his, his he's and he's doing really well now. Uh, he's, his little teeth have all healed up. But, um, so she is indeed a clever cat. Mm -hmm. But um, no, listen, I think what's most important is that we're clear with ourselves about what our goals are. Um, you know, um, my primary goal and objective at this point um, is teaching. I mean, uh, and uh, you know, I myself grew up in uh, had a single mom, uh, working class uh, kind of uh, background, where you know, woke up a couple times where maybe we didn't have power or the phones, or we ran out, you know, got food from the, you know. Um, from the uh, kind of uh, f uh, kind of food providers and, and things like that, um, and so you know I I have the greatest respect for students that are working really hard to put themselves through school, um, you know, um, and an understanding that we all come uh, from different backgrounds. Uh, I had some financial success working as a, a ad executive for many years, and so now my primary objective is really much more about trying to I hope help students the way I had some professors that really, really, really helped, uh, really helped me. Um, and so, uh, so my objectives are a little different. Like my consulting, like I want to do things that, you know, it's very part time because my focus is, uh, is teaching, but if I can consult with a client, like I do some consulting with Orange Theory Fitness, they have hired several of our students um, from internships and full-time roles. And so especially if I can consult with someone that I know is like, oh, they're likely to uh, they're likely to benefit from introductions or if it's something that I think like some of the work I've done on AI and marketing org um, that I think helps inform what I might be able to bring into the classroom. That's kind of the primary objective for me is be involved with fun, cool work that I can hopefully help keep me up to date. Like as an example, when I go to teach the chapter on Google, uh, the last time I got to the chapter and I'm like, oh no, this all changed. <laughs> And so, uh, you know, the Google, like some of the performance max change that's in AdWords, that mm -hmm. wasn't in the textbook yet, and that had all just changed. Um, and so I was like, I got to change what I, but uh, my goal with consulting is to stay aware just enough in the industry that I can remain um, as up to date as possible for students. And so that's my objective. Um, but the objective, I think, if you are starting an endeavor, whatever that is, if the business endeavor is to make money, or and that's valid, uh, to do good in the community, to do fun work with your friends that you love and care about, and make enough money to support yourself, there's all different objectives. I think it, back to my original point about like, um, how do you know if a marketing campaign is successful? But really, how do you know if any adventure is successful? Is understanding for you. What is your definition of success so that you can, that can be your kind of North Star? Um, and your definition of success does not need to be the same as someone else. So uh, it, is, it is never necessary uh, 
Uh, it is neither desired nor required to have someone else define success for you. You get to define what success is for you. I get to define what success is for me. And I think uh, that's, an important, uh, that's an important thing that should guide any venture, uh, especially business ventures that you're entering into. How do you define success? Um, and if you define that first, you're more likely to achieve that for yourself. Well, on that note, we want to thank you for coming on to the show Good. today. Thank you. thank you so much for having um, me. Uh, this has been Gator Bites, the official business podcast of the Maryland Davies College of Business. Uh, I'm your host, Miguel Gomez. Our producers have been Victor Henson, Ricardo Saint. Uh, set designer is Evangelina Vasquez. And we want to invite you to remember to follow us on social media at UHDCOB. And remember to take a bite out of business. And we'll see you later, Gators.